very warm welcome to Morning Prayer from St Mark's and this is Morning Prayer for Tuesday. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Glory to the Father, and, and to, to the, the Son, Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Our reading today is taken from Proverbs, chapter 3 beginning to read at verse 27. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbour, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you now have it with you. Do not plot harm against your neighbour who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. For the Lord detests the perverse man, but takes the upright into his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but, his, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. The wise inherit honour, but fools he holds up to shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, have you heard of FOMO? It's a phrase going round these days. FOMO stands for fear of missing out. And it's a phrase used for the fear that you're, the sort of nagging fear that you're missing all the good things in life, that your life is passing you by and you're not seizing it. Apparently it's a big problem, or a lot of people feel it these days. I think this passage is addressing FOMO and virtue. Because we know we have to be virtuous, but sometimes it feels as if that means we're missing out. Discipline, self-denial, sacrifice, generosity, sometimes don't feel as appealing as indulgence, popularity, wealth. We fear that by following the virtuous path, we're missing out on something. 
missing out on the fun or the pleasure or the popularity or success we could have. And this passage is popping that bubble of FOMO, that illusion that we must be missing out if we're taking a virtuous road. So let's look at it a little bit more. It talks about active virtue first. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. And this is a very simple little reminder that virtue doing good is not just about what I can't do, but about what I can do. It's not about what I shouldn't do, but about what I should as well. About going out of one's way to care for those who need it, if one has it in one's power to do so. This is something actually I think we've been rediscovering the last 50 or 100 years in, in the Christian faith. The extent to which the Christian life is not just about not doing things, but at least as much about doing things. Not just about avoiding vice, but about doing good to all, and especially to those in need. But very often we can procrastinate the good that we know we're supposed to do. We can put it off. So the passage says, Do not say to your neighbour, come back later, I'll give it to you tomorrow, when you have it with you now. And actually, that's really easy to do, I think. We put off the things we know we ought to do, because we don't really want to. We feel that we would be losing out by being generous. When um, when I was ordained, um, they, uh, they started paying me uh, <coughs> a little bit more of a stipend than I'd had as a student, uh, and that meant I needed to give more to charity. And uh, I decided this very early on. But, you know, it took me about nine months to get round to setting up the standing order, setting up the, the actual giving. It was really hard to make myself put in the effort to be generous. It was really easy to procrastinate doing good. Because it felt as if generosity would be losing out. Would be losing out on something good. That fear of missing out. Or what about malice? Do not plot harm against your neighbour who lives trustfully near you, says our passage. Well, hopefully most of us aren't plotting physical harm against our neighbours, however annoying they might have become during lockdown. But it's very easy to plot a subtle sort of harm, a gentle sort of harm perhaps, against those we have to do with, with gossip with talking about them behind their back, with running them down, whether that's chatting at the water cooler or um, typing online social media. Gossiping about people in a malicious way is really easy. Whenever I've worked in the secular world, I've found that one of the hardest things to deal with has been just how much of a culture there's been of malicious gossip, saying nasty things about people. Why do we do it? What's the appeal of that? Well, I think it is that we feel as if we can gain through pulling others down. We can build ourselves up through pulling others down better than we can by building others up. We feel as if um, to make ourselves look good in others' eyes, we have to make other people look worse. And so it's really easy to speak maliciously about others. And sometimes that can be just as harmful as more direct malice. Again, we fear that, I, I suspect there's a fear, that if we don't engage in any of that, we get left behind, left out of the conversation, missing out. Do not envy a violent man, our passage says, or choose any of his ways. And here we get to the heart of it, that sense of, of envy, of fear of missing out, of feeling like... Um, the ways of vice must be more rewarding than the ways of virtue. Again, it's, it's really easy to do that. Whether you're a child uh, envying the cool kid who says what he likes, goes where he wants, drinks, swears, looks cool, or whether you're a little bit older and you find yourself uh, envying those who have been successful in the world, who are driving the BMW and making the six-figure salary. It's really easy to envy others, 
It's really easy to think that we must have missed out by doing what is right. And this passage is reminding us that it is not so. For the Lord detests a perverse man, but takes the upright into his confidence. It's often said that sin, that vice, is sweet in the mouth and sour in the stomach. It looks good, but it turns out bad. It looks great in the windscreen and terrible in the rearview mirror. It's like though when you're a kid and those supermarket counters of cheap sweets that are full of colours and intriguing smells and you blow your pocket money on a little bag of them, eat them all and then spend the rest of the day being sick. It looked like a good idea at the time, but it really wasn't worth it. It looked good before, it was attractive before, but it wasn't worth the consequences. Virtue can look unappealing from the outside, but like a healthy meal, once you've eaten it, you feel a lot better for it. And the reason for all this, I think our passage is telling us, is rooted in the fact that God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's talking about when he tells us how to live. He is our designer. He is our maker, our creator. There's no part of our world that he doesn't understand. So when he tells us the right way to live, he knows what he's saying. He knows what he's doing. We're not going to miss out by following, our instru by following his instructions. And he is the judge of the world. He will oversee the consequences of every action. So when he tells us that some actions have consequences to be avoided, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. What he has blessed will never be a waste, and what he has cursed will never be worth it. The lure of sin, the, the promise of sin, is deceitful. Sin always lies and never delivers. Hoarding our wealth and not being generous to others might look like it's a way to have more of this life's good things, but it's not nearly as rewarding as generosity and kindness and blessing others. The wealth we hoard will turn out to be stale and cold and unsatisfying. Malice and gossip tearing others down to build ourselves up may look like it'll help us get ahead in the crowd, but it'll poison our relationships and in the end no one will trust us. Envy, um, wanting to be like the more wealthy or successful or cool uh, people we see out there, will be very appealing at first. But I guarantee those people are far less happy than we are, far less happy than those treading the path of virtue. If God has pointed us to a way of virtue that looks harder and less appealing, it's because it is a good road. It is the mountain road to green pastures and fine views. We will not miss out by going the way he points us. We will not miss out by following his instructions. Eternity is in his hand, and therefore the outcomes of our actions are in his hand too. Vice looks appealing. Sin looks sweet in the mouth, but turns sour in the stomach. But following God's way and the way of virtue, we will never miss out. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23 We come to the great shepherd of the flock, one who knows his flock by name, knows each lamb by name. Also, what we need and when we need it. And so we shall never want. At this time when lock up is beginning to perhaps be something that we're looking at in the past.
past. We're looking forward to perhaps going back to normal. Do we know what normal is? We pray for all children and teenagers who've been working with homeschool and long to meet with peer groups again. We pray for those teachers and parents that at this time of thinking of going from lockdown to school, there would be much wisdom as to how school will be for the next few months. We pray for all whose ordination to deacon and ordination to priests are only a few months away. Father and faithful shepherd, we pray that those who are going to be ordained, that this will be done in a way which is both sanctifying and safe. Pray for all who are anticipating returning to work. We pray for all whose colleagues have died and there will be many vacancies. We pray for those who will find it difficult at this time. We also pray that there will be a purity of thought, not wanting to get the best job, but actually seeing if the best job is what we really want. And if it is the best job. We continue to pray for all who are sick, body, mind, spirit, for those who are depressed. those who are ill for reasons other than COVID. And we give thanks for the results of the lockdown and the reduced number of deaths. Faithful shepherd, keep us from thinking that hey, we should get back to normal now. Help us to be led by you in all that we aspire to, all that we think, all that we want to do. Take us where we perhaps don't want to be, and yet where it is best for us. Help us in ways that we have never ever thought possible. May our trust be in you and you alone. Liberate all who follow Christ from narrowness of vision and 
limited discipleship. Throughout this day, enliven our minds, inspire our conversation, inform our decisions. Increase our faith and decrease our pride. Until we know that when we face the unexpected, we do not stand alone. Faithful Shepherd, hear these prayers made in the presence of you and each other. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'll call it for grace. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power. Grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all we do may be according to your will, so that we do always what is righteous in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Keep us good, Lord. Under the shadow of your mercy, in this time of uncertainty and distress, sustain and support the anxious and fearful, and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in your comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.